everybody, it's Deepa Snow, and we're live this evening at Gold Park here in Hillsboro, North Carolina. And tonight we're going to be talking about living with frontal temporal lobe dementia, FTD. And the reason we're talking about that is we have support group locally, and it's a great thing to talk about. So frontal temporal dementia. If you guys want to come and have a seat, feel free. Settle on in. Love to have you. And there's some cards there if you'd like. Excellent. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is the kind of dementia that you have, and there's some characteristics. If you have a frontal temporal dementia, you are classically younger than other people who get dementia. It's a young person's dementia. It's the most common young person's dementia that there is. And a second thing that's more likely to be the case, you're more likely to have issues with legal or financial or work-related things because many people with FTD are still working or they're still trying to work. Um, they get into trouble financially because choices that they make or decisions that they make aren't great decisions. We also know that for people who are living with FTD, one of the other things that can happen is they're very vulnerable to suggestions that people make. Sort of like suggestions to bet on things or to go places and spend money to do stuff. Credit cards and running debt up and you don't realize how much you're running up um, and you don't even realize how bad it is. Even when you get the bills, it still doesn't seem all that bad. And so it goes on and on. Um, relationships can be problematic with many FTD kinds of dementias. And one of the reasons it's problematic, frankly, is because the person is not able to see the other perspective or point of view anymore. It's really hard when you have frontal variant, at least, of, of the frontal temporal dementias. You can't read facial expression the way you used to be able to read facial expression. So, well, why are you upset? and you can't get the meaning behind things. And so it really can be irritating to be with someone and they go, well, I don't understand why I can't drive. And it's like, well, because you've had three accidents and you have two tickets for speeding. Yeah, but I still don't understand why I can't I drive. And so, the <laughs> so if you're the person who's with that individual, it's really hard sometimes not to get frustrated with, what do you mean, why can't you drive? What did I just say? And it's like you said I had speeding tickets. Yeah? And it's not a memory problem. And so that's the other frustrating thing is people can frequently have great memories and still have frontal temporal. And so for many individuals who think dementia, they think, well, then that's not dementia. It's like, yeah, it is. It's still dementia. It's a problem, and it's a memory problem, but it's not the same kind of memory problem. So it's often not being able to way find your way around the way you used to be able to. So you can't use a map like you used to, or you can't figure out direction, particularly when you're trying to get back from somewhere. You go somewhere and then it's, huh, well, I wonder how you get out of here. And um, uh, you know what, I'll turn left. I bet I will recognize something if I turn left. And it's like, well, you don't recognize something when you turn left. Well, I'll just try again. And so we have people who are getting lost, but we're not talking about a block or two. We're talking state or another state or running out of gas on the side of the road because you're like, well, you know, I'll go a little further and not noticing the gas gauge dropping down and thinking, you know what, I should probably stop and get gas because, you know, it's getting sort of low. Just not linking things together like you typically would have seen the person do it before. And again, all of these are changes. And so it's really hard when somebody's realizing, what is going on here? Because it's not consistent. <laughs> so if you go to get somebody evaluated or looked at very early on, when you go to get it evaluated, there's no symptoms. And so you try to convince the provider that, no, I'm telling you that you know, this is, this is what's happening. And it's like, well, I'm just not seeing it. He did great on all our tests for dementia. It's really frustrating. And so then the person who's trying to be supportive also starts to feel really isolated. And you start to wonder, is it me? Am I, am I making mountains out of molehills? Is this just, I do I mean, is it because our relationship isn't okay? Or, or what, what is going on here? Um, and then things start to get a little more consistent. And you might notice that 
people are making decisions that are inconsistent with how they would have made decisions. Um, they either can't make decisions, they're immobilized by making decisions, or they keep making decisions that are like crazy, sort of like, whoa, where is this decision come from? What are you talking, what do you mean you gave so-and-so money, or you did this, or you did that? And so if you're in a spousal relationship or a friendship relationship, it often feels uneven or unequal. So that's the front part. So I, we have some folks here who are, are part of that, and they keep it on me. But do you guys have any questions or any thoughts or, or things you want to talk about particularly? Because tonight is just sort of an open night of talking about MPD. Um, we'll we have uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Support. Yeah, so we're talking about early signs and signals right now, but as things are moving forward, where this gets really tricky is because it feels so different than it used to, relationships feel really different, and how you're going to manage things. Um, it gets tricky because finances often are entering into the picture and availability of resources for younger people particularly. Uh, it gets tricky because when you're younger, you don't qualify. You don't qualify for this, you don't qualify for that. You have to wait, you have to do two years in order to get permanent disability. And even then, you have often people will not qualify the first time. So then you have to submit again and go through the process again, which is just like the last thing you need at that point. But as we're moving forward, one of the realities is sequencing. How do you do activities? How do you do tasks? How do you get dressed? How do you uh, eat a meal? How do you go to the bathroom? How do you wash yourself? That becomes more and more challenging. And so I, I could stand there and I could know I want to get dressed and I have a clue what's the first step of getting dressed. Or I might not want to get dressed. I don't see the point of it. I'm fine. And it's like, but these are the same clothes I've had on for like two days now that's been on. And so what starts to happen is how do we give care? I mean, how do we get the right care? How do we get this to happen? And many places that say they do dementia care don't do FTD. They can't handle it because it doesn't look like dementia. And so they're still trying to use language and words and describe how do you do that. Well, you put your right arm in the sleeve. I put my right arm, yeah. So I do what? You put your right arm in the sleeve. Okay. And what we're asking a person to do is go from a verbal piece of information to performing a motor task. And what we've done historically is when I wanted to dress, I would just do the motor task. But I did it in an order that the front of my brain taught me. And now it's just automatic. And what I've lost is the automatic. And so even when you try to give me assistance, you put your hands off me. What are you doing? And I get distressed because I don't understand what you're doing to me, and you're trying to help me, but I see it as not all right. So when we talk about we're getting further and further along in this condition, then, well, where do we get care? How do we get care? We need somebody who's really skillful to do this because it's really hard to do this if you don't have a lot of skill. So um, I'm going to have my husband come up for a minute and, and I'm going to show you a couple of um, techniques because this is the middle now that I'm talking about. This is a late state because these are people who early on if you just have a frontal barrier particularly, um, you're still moving and shaking and going and biking and, and doing all that stuff. As we're moving into the middle of the disease, though, you're starting to notice a little less fluid, a little less fluidness to the game. And you, if somebody gets distracted, there's that little stutter step that you might run into, and you might be finding catching your feet when you're going and getting real busy doing things. So what happens, though, is if I'm trying to do something and I say, I'm going to go help, I want you to take your shirt off. And what just happened is he's watching my face for information. And he keeps watching me, and I touch the shirt and take your shirt off. And I'm not getting my message through. And what I will start doing if I'm not careful is <laughs> I get bigger. <laughs> I get, take your shirt. And so I'm 
separating each of the words, thinking, okay, I'll break it down. But you can tell I'm also sounding frustrated, and that's like not helpful. And that's what we see with care providers. And so now if a care provider, not even family, does this, then we get a stronger reaction. And this is where people living with dementia, particularly frontal temporal, start to get reputations. Because what he might do is he might grab me. And why is he grabbing me? Why do y'all think? He doesn't know what I'm doing, and to him it's not okay. And he just, and I keep, and then I struggle. And if I struggle, what does he think I want to do then? So, let, he thinks I want to fight. And so what starts happening is he views it as an act of aggression on my part. And so now I might try to do things like, I'm going to start that, and it's like, whoa, bad idea, bad idea, don't do that, because now it feels like I'm sneaking around and doing things. So this is the case where I want to, and this seems odd for people, but I actually want to like, get connected. And I want to be on the person's preferred side. So if somebody's right-handed, I want to start being on this side because this is the hand he would have started things with because that's the dominant hand. That's where all the skill comes from. So I'm going to give him a message. Yeah, yeah, sure enough. And so I'm giving the cue, but I'm actually moving the hand with the motion, his hand to his hand. And in the middle of this condition, I can also cue people. I can frequently get people cued all the way through a test. Now, the trouble comes if he doesn't think he needs to do it. <laughs> and I will have to create an opportunity that makes sense. So I'll show him the new shirt before I try to take the old shirt off. Because if I don't show him the new shirt, it just feels like I'm trying to get his clothes off, and it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm fine. And I want to show him the new shirt so he knows what we're going to do. We're going to get in the new shirt. But I can't have it too close, because if he takes it, I'll put it over top of that shirt. <laughs> it's like, it's not what you should do. But it's that kind of sequencing. And so it gets tiring, and it gets hard, <laughs> because we're sort of running into every task we do is built on sequence. And so one of the very common statements people have at this point is, what do I, what do, I do now? Well, what's next on the agenda? Mm -hmm. And they come and they stand. People will come and stand. And this is people who used to be able to engage themselves for a whole day. But they'll come and they'll stand in front of you and go, what do I do now? And you say, well, why don't you empty the trash? And go, OK. And you're thinking, are you going to go do it? And the answer is, I don't know what to do. I need you to cue me to this next task because I don't even know what exactly we're talking about. I just know that you want me to do something. You gave me something, but I'm not sure what it is you want me to go do, and I'll need you. But tell you what, come with me. And so now, everything we do, it has to be done in partnership, which is also tiring, because what does that mean? Does that mean I could have three people living with dementia and help three people at the same time? So it's almost a one-on-one, -on -one, but then the person likes some time alone. But then, what are we going to do with that time alone? Well, this is where people can get into doing things that seem destructive, but they're actually trying to figure out something to do that makes sense. So taking things apart is a lot easier than putting them together. So disent disentangling things, taking things out of things, unpiling things, taking a table apart, taking the sink apart. Taking things apart becomes something that is sort of enjoyable. I take it apart. It's cool because I can take things apart. And so it gets frustrating because we could be taking things apart that have value um, and taking things apart that are problematic if you take them apart because you can't get them back together. Because the other thing that we will often see with people with FTD is they still have strength. They're incredibly still strong. Their muscles are strong, their hands are strong, their bodies are strong, and they can keep going <laughs> for a long time. Which is also exhausting because you just want to wait. You just want to wait for a little bit. But they're in a go mode. And they can't, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? The other side, though, is equally frustrating, which is apathy. 
how do it as we sit. So that's the middle of the disease. So in the later state, we're starting to talk about how do you help somebody with their problem? How do you help them unfold it? How do you get arms up so you can get in the armpits? How can you help somebody get on and off a toilet? Because what's happening now is I don't know how to move my body anymore. Um, we also, by this time, almost all frontal variant has also really lost significant amount of language. Thing. Both getting the language in and getting the language out. So it's no longer just a frontal executive problem, now it is comprehension and the inability to comprehend and the inability to get my body to do what I want it to do either. I, I can't even make it behave itself. So it, it does stuff. I'm not in charge of it. It's sort of spontaneous stuff. So um, for instance, if I'm scared and, and something scares me off, I might really react very quickly. And then right after, I could be really sorry I didn't mean to do anything like that. But I will be very quick when it's a reaction. But I can't protect myself with my reactions. So it means if I trip, I won't have the skill to get my hands out fast enough to block the fall. So what starts to happen is if I do like moving around and I do like being mobile, then I catch my foot and rather than catch myself on the way down, you're starting to see me damage my shoulders and, and crack my head and hurt my arms and hurt my legs a lot more because I don't have the ability to, to step out and save the fall. So that's sort of in the later kinds of situations with frontal tumors. Um, those dementias. So those dementias are the kind of dementia where um, people are at high risk for overeating um, for a while because they are very oral. Um, this part of your body has lots of sensation and so putting things in your mouth is a skill that you still have and that desire to satisfy that, a lot of people will put on a lot of weight during the middle of the condition. And it's hard to get people not to eat. Um, because this is, a, this is an ability I have. You know, this kind of thing. And I also seek it out. Because the part of my brain that's primitive is asking for sugar. It's asking for glucose. It wants the crunchy. It wants the salt. And so I'm grabbing and I'm putting things in my mouth. Constantly. And it can be to a place where you have to secure foodstuffs. And you have to make sure the person can't have access. Because they will actually put too much in their mouth when they're getting into a place where their skill at chewing is not as great as their desire to put stuff in their mouth. Um, we can have some people who become hyperoral, meaning they will chew on clothing, they will chew on their own body parts, um, they will chew on items that aren't food. Uh, there are some resources out there, some dense things. Um, they can chew. Uh, on, on their fingers to where they will actually chew the pads off of their fingers. And, it, and you can see, well, I mean, it's like ah, chewing nails is really common. Um, but they can also mess with their lip, where they'll, they'll do things with their lips and they'll pick and pick and pick. And any scabs, may, men with beards will frequently mess with the hair follicles and try to dig at them. And so that becomes problematic. And it's these sort of spontaneous high sensory things. Um, so, but there are some resources, mostly resources that we've used historically for people with autism. Adults with autism, really dense things that people can gnaw on, they won't come apart. And they're not latex, and they're really dense, and they, they have some some return to them. So that satisfies. Um, we can, people can get into grinding in that later state, um, or a repetitive making of the sound. Ah, 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 which is self-stimulation. Um, but we can also use it to judge whether somebody's doing okay or not. If my usual sound production is ah, and you start hearing, ah, ah, then you know, whoa, 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 something's really wrong. Pain, distress, something's really wrong. So, um, so that is, there's some of the things with weight state. Uh, weight loss will be really significant. Chewing and swallowing um, become problematic in the weight weight. 
for frontal hearing particularly, um, but also for frontal temporals in general. So, other questions? <laughs> ah, that's late state, that only has. Um, length of time, um, because you know that's really a variable. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be as short as five years or as long as 25 years, even for frontal temporal, which is many people find surprising because that the thing that's in the papers is five to seven. I mean, that may be, yeah, but I've seen a lot more 10, 10, 12, 15 years than I've seen five to seven. And part of it is because people don't notice the early signs for way too long. And it's not uncommon for it to take two to five years for somebody with frontal temporal dementia to have really significant symptoms and you're still trying to get a decent diagnosis. Um, and it gets tripped up by people trying to be helpful. And they're like, he still looks like he's doing pretty good. She seems like she's okay. And it's like, you're not living in my house. <laughs> this, is not, this is not okay. Um, because it can look on the surface not that bad, because there is still sometimes some social cover. But then when that social piece starts wearing off, then the flatness or the inability to be accurate, it can have emotional extremes of flatness, and that's really hot, rough. Then. And it's hard to know what to do in those cases, because it's just this lack of emotional reading. Um, it's very different than a Parkinson's reading. It's just that flat. And also, no recognition of spatial need. Um, and so, it's not uncommon for people to walk right up on top, and you're really, in, really close when you least expect it, or be right behind you a lot. And yet, if you get really close, there's sort of a different reaction. That's a very different one. But then moving into your space, very common. Moving into stuff and not recognizing. It's not your space, and, and not realizing it. And so they're not doing it on purpose. Somebody yeah. commented, my dad ignores everything my mom says. It's not a hearing issue. It feels he's being def defiant. Ah, so there's a sense that it's, um, it's because the person is being defiant. And it's like, yeah, if you've been in a relationship before, the FT starts before the frontal hearing starts, the expectation of the relationship. So what starts happening is the person who was the other partner I just can't listen to you because you're not you're not being you. And yet you're trying to help me, but I can't stand your voice anymore. And so I tune you out. And that's most common with frontal temporal dementia, where they tune out the person who's trying to provide the information. And yet they can do okay with people they don't know very well. Suddenly there's much more of a responsiveness or a generational difference where a kid can get somebody to do it, but you can't. And that's not that uncommon. And it's probably something related to they don't register voice as having helpful information. And then on the other hand, sometimes it's only the partner that can get the person to do anything. Which you think, OK, well, at least there's that person. It's like, no. I mean, if you're the only person that can get something to happen, you're talking about 24 staffing. You're the only person that can get something to happen. And that's not an OK place to be, because this dimension will wear you out. Um, because you've lost your person. This is the one dimension where you truly do feel like you've lost the person you've always known before you lose them to the dimension. And it's just, that's not who I married. That's not, that's not my mom, that's not my dad, that's not. It feels really isolating because the part, part of your brain is the part that gives you the personality that, that you recognize and the, and the care of techniques that you recognize, how they took care of you, how they related to you, how they responded, um, that sensitivity, that emotional sensitivity that they have to you. And now it might be leaking all over the place, and so they get really tearful and stuff, and it's like, oh, let's not do this again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I know, I know, and you just don't want to go through it again because it's so traumatizing to know that it hurts them that much and you can't figure out how to make this stop. There's no way to plug that leak of the emotions. It seems like they can they can register your emotions, but the, the words are almost like you're speaking a different language. They can't understand your words at all. If you're angry or you're 
So that actually is the, another part of the brain. That's those temporal lobes. So the frontal is where they don't get your emotion. They can't read your emotion. So what you're talking about is somebody who has the temporal lobe problem as well. And so when you have temporal lobe problems, it's the language areas of the brain that are no longer doing their job. And for frontal temporal dementia, one of the most common things is either they can't get the data in, or they can't put it out, or they can't do either. And so there's a couple of variations. And one is called a fluent kind of aphasia, and one is the non-fluent. So, so the, um, the, uh, the uh, when you, when you, when you, um, you can, you can, you can um, it's, 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 it's what, so that's the non-fluent version. So I know the thought I have, but I can't get the words to come out to match the thought. And, 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 and I'll start it, I'll, I'll try to start the sound or the, the um, I'll find the first sound of it and then I, then I can't find the word. And it's not that I don't know what I'm going to say. That's, you can see it in my face that I know what I want to say. I can't find the sound that will allow me to say what I want to say. But then the other phenomenological issue is one that's really contricular. And it is one that will really, when you do it, you really just like, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it, it will be the one that you can just not even, um, with all of it, it's just hard to particulate. And that's a very fluent aphasia. <laughs> Oh, I have no idea what she's talking about. But it's done with a nice fluency, and every now and then a word will be embedded, and it's, it's a decent word, and it does have meaning. On the other side of that coin is trying to take language in. And the first words I'll start losing are nouns, you know, the names of things. And so you tell me to go get a cup, and I'm going to come. And I know, I know you're asking me to go get something, but I don't, I can't go from the word to the image of the thing. And so there's no way for me to find the cup because I can't go from the word to the auto object. And yet, I know you've asked me to do something. And I feel so stupid. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And then if we're not careful, we go and get a cup. The cup! And it's like, oh, we have the cup. Whereas if we've done, can we go get a a mug, a cup, something, oh, yeah. Because they get still have the ability to get the idea that they can't get the words, either in or out or both. And then it's, I can't string words together. So put your, put your sock on. On what? On my foot? Put your sock on your foot. Put my sock on my foot. And I can hold the sock. And you point to your foot. What's a 50 50 chance at this point? What would I do? Instead of putting it on my foot, whose foot do I put it on? Your foot. And it's like, no, 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 no. And that's where, you know, or you get one sock on one foot and then I give me hand the other sock and I put it on the same foot. It's like, no, what are you doing? That's the same foot. You need it on the other foot. And everything that's logical to us, that combination of language and, and logic, it's just not working. And it just seems so, it's not that hard. And it's like, it is that hard because the part of the brain between the language and the front of the brain where you sequence both of them are broke. And so I can't compensate. Like, it's not like, if you just show me what to do, then I can do it, because now I still have the sequence. So I start watching you, and I try to follow, and then I lost where we were. And I don't know what I do now. And so I, many people just give up. And those are the folks who don't want to do it themselves. And I'm just going to sit around because I don't know what to do. It's just, it's too hard. Because I make so many mistakes. I don't like making mistakes. So if you have somebody who's never liked making mistakes, those are folks who are often stop trying. 
because it's just too frustrating to make mistakes. We have a question. How do we handle layering of clothing and refusal to remove any layers, especially in warm weather? In warm weather. Yeah, putting on things makes more sense to the point than taking things off. So taking them off, actually, you have to recognize they're on you and get them off, and you can't actually see them on you a lot. So what you do is you see things out there, and you can get them on, and then you just get them on, and then you put another layer on, and then you put another layer on, and then you start getting warm, but you don't know what to do about it. So one of the tricky parts is to actually, um, number one, think about how would we get a layer on. And we don't want to do an argument about it. And so the tricky part about getting layers off is we've got to help a person go one, two, so we, I usually use the lower edge of something because it gives them the best chance to be able to see what I'm talking about. And so I'll help the person, so I would again get to the side with the hand, and now what I do is if he had multiple layers, so dip one, two, three, four, one. And now we're going to do one, and I'm going to see if I can get him to take off one. But the counting can be helpful. That's one of those retained skills. One, two, three, four. So if I go one, two, three, we're going to take off one. And see if I can get him to work with the one. Because it is a challenge. And so taking off a shirt this is one thing where sometimes what we want to do is do the cross the arms and up and over. And cross the arms is actually a complex motor task. You have to cross the midline. You have to realize when you do this, you'll come up and then come out. So instead, what we might try is I'm going to bring it up here, take one arm out at a time. And it's not going to be an up and over thing. And I might, come up from, I might have them come up from the back and bring it up, bring this arm out, other arm out, um, rather than trying to do the crossover total body thing, because it's really a complex rhythmic task that they often are not going to be able to do. So. Um, but no guarantees. Um, the other thing is, if you're really concerned about heat, wet the shirts. Because wetting the shirts takes like a core top body temperature down. So, I mean, truly, at this in this temperature that we have today, if somebody had four shirts on, I would wipe the shirts. Because that's the other reason people take them off. But it'll also cool the core temperature down. And if I'm worried about somebody overheating and I don't have a way to get them out, pouring water on, lukewarm water will actually cool uh, because core body temperature is 98.6. And even if I do a 72 degree water, you know, um, I can actually get the temperature down pretty quick. And I need to get their core temperature down. And then I want them damp and uncomfortable so they'll come out closer. People do it more when they're wet, they call them dry. So, anything else folks are curious about? So, how many folks you got there, Seb, out there on Tic Tac Land? Uh, currently 82 viewers so far, right now. All right, cool. Several so thousand come and go, but. Several so thousand come and go, but right now we have 82 checking in on what we're talking about. So, any other thoughts or questions about frontal capital dementias? It used to be considered a very rare dementia. Um, we suspect somewhere around 5 to 10% of people before they turn 65 will have a dementia in the frontal temporal. Our friendly dog park is not so familiar. They're on the phone over there. We're having a little bit of disagreement. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah. So, 5 to 10 percent of the population will have dementia, and of that 5 to 10 percent, the vast majority will end up with an MTD, not an Alzheimer's. Young onset Alzheimer's is actually relatively rare. Young onset frontal temporal is much more common, um, as is vascular dementia. The other kind of young onset you can have is vascular. You can also have a Lewy body. That's the other kind of front early uh, onset kind of dementia you can have. And people can have more than one. When you say early onset, what does that age 
Yeah, the age range is anywhere from um, 25, on average, 25 up to 67, 70. Yeah, the average is around yeah, 45 to 55 is a very common time to start experiencing some of the very early signals and symptoms. Uh, early 60s is another time. Um, unfortunately for many people, it's after they have their families, and so we're now having kids involved and family dynamics that are going on as well, because it's long enough that you've done other things in your life, um, but it's also a critical time when you should still be earning income, and so that then becomes a big issue often for the part of trying to figure out how we're going to negotiate all this financial stuff, because it has huge impact, and it's definitely much more of an issue for people with FTD than any other country, because it's a, often a, a condition that takes you out of the workforce and way early. And these are often high-powered folks who did a lot of really important things in the world, um, and so they can't do the work they were doing before very quickly. And it's hard for them to learn a new job because you have to learn sequencing, and you have to be able to be flexible. And so they may try a number of things and fail with them. And so that's really upsetting. Because even if I'm not trying to do really high tech stuff, I still can't figure out how to do stuff. And it starts to feel like, what's wrong with me? And so depression is a big issue. Um, apathy is a big issue. Anxiety is a big issue. Um, because I just can't make it all make sense to me. And then the other folks that get anxious are care partners. Because you don't know when the bomb's going to go off or when things are going to be okay or when. You're are really going to come through them um, because it tends to come in waves at first. The question about how to get them to eat fortified food when they refuse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, food that's good for you. Fortified stuff. The stuff that you want people take it in because it's good for you and they can care less. So if we can't disguise it as something that's enjoyable, you're probably not going to get it in. And so if we're wanting something that's better for somebody, we've got to figure out how to make it taste and look like something that's really sexy and fun and tasty and yummy. Um, so this is where you want to be creative and not be so rigid. Because the more rigid you are, the less likely you're going to be able to be successful. So consider, you know, a strawberry milkshake. And what you can put in a strawberry milkshake that somebody might not notice. Because I can fortify that strawberry milkshake with some protein, um, but I can't get them to eat something that has protein. That gets to be more and more and more of a challenge. Um, so looking for things that are tasty and sweet, they have, have some sweet in them, and let me see if I can't hide in what I need to hide in there so that we're getting nourishment in what we're seeking. Um, meds are often a big problem. Oh, and we're in Hillsborough, uh, North Carolina. We have a train that comes through with great regularity. turns on and goes, not safe, do not sleep. You must be on high alert. Not only must you be on high alert, you've got to go seek and search and make sure that nothing is happening. And so there's a lot of checking behavior and seeking behavior and roaming behavior and taking things apart, getting into places and spaces behavior. Um, and then morning comes, and now they're ready to take it. But that nighttime thing will wear you out because it's not a comfortable time. 
the distress level gets pretty high. Um, frequently, what we do suggest is going ahead and seeing if the, you can get the person to take breaks and have uh, small amounts of food going in. Because one thing that will help people settle is getting nourishment. And you have to catch it when they're not in a high distress state. Because people won't want to eat if they're in distress. But if you can get them to snack a little bit with a complex carbon and a protein. So uh, Nutella and graham crackers. Um, something that you can have if they like it, they'll munch on it, and that helps sort of settle it a little bit. Because they're burning a lot of blood sugar when they're on the bottom. Um, they're also getting a lot of chemical distress, a lot of cortisol is shooting in. And so a lot of um, breathing and um, worry and, and a sense of worry and, well, no, I don't know, and, and a lot of self-talking, a lot of distress self-talking, and, um, and not real safe either because in such a state of distress, visual field is usually about like this. And so looking and looking and looking and missing so many things that are dangerous, which is why the care partner doesn't get any sleep because you can't trust that they won't fall, they won't trip, they won't get in trouble, and they may come keep waking you up too because they can't have dubious sleep either. And so that's distressing. Um, and that can continue through the whole thing. If you try to use medications, it's like we have to give them an elephant's load of medications and then they have the, the overflow and they'll have all the, all the next day, basically, they are dysfunctional um, because you can't get a happy meal because the drugs are not really, their brain is really wired to metabolize those quickly because you've got to stay alert and so it doesn't work. So they can metabolize a whole lot until you like do the elephant dose. And then you knock them out, but then you're truly knocked out for a long time. And then you're worried about them being well nourished and, and being okay and interacting because they're not. And so it feels like, what do we do? We just learn to live with the nighttime stuff because it's just not worth it because you can't figure out a good thing. FTD more than any, the meds, the meds are a mess. Um, people will put them on cocktail. People on cocktails, and you have to bring off the cocktail because it's a it overdoes and they become toxic. And so it's on, it's off. The meds that we would normally be using for many dementias, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, Aricetex, Long, Vazidine, the Nemenda, can't use them with these folks because it actually is not what's going on, and so it makes it worse. <laughs> much worse. And it's like, you won't know that until you, the doctor says, well, we can try this. And you go, okay. And then it's like, oh, we're not trying that again. Um, because once you've had those reactions, you're pretty sh gun shot about trying it again because it could be really devastating. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you guys out there on TikTok. Uh, it's about that time. We're going to say thank you and good night. And for you guys, thanks for coming out. Hi, I'm Tifa Snow, and you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching, and if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out, and you might want to visit our website, www.tifasnow.com, where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.